we've put in one inch adhesive tape on this filly to demonstrate where anatomically you'd be placing an intramuscular injection. I want to go over uh, the major sites and uh, then discuss some of the pros and cons of each site with you. So if you look here on her neck, right here in front of the scapula, below the nuchal ligament, and above the spine, you have this triangle right in here, which is a real good, safe place to give an intramuscular injection. Uh, the good news about giving an IM injection here is you're in a relatively safe location in relationship to your patient, so that you're up here at the front end, and you could even potentially give an injection all by yourself, you know, hanging on to the horse and giving the injection, which you might be expected to do. One of the other major muscle masses that we use is the gluteals, right up here. I'm not sure, maybe we can move Abby a little bit so that her gluteals are a little bit more visible to the camera. But right up here on the top of the rear end. The good news about this location is it's a major muscle mass. You got lots of place to put it. The bad news is about this location is that first of all you're at her rear end. And second of all, if you started to have a vaccination reaction or an abscess, you have very bad drainage there. Your third choice would be over the semimembranosa, semitendinosus, right there on the very back side of her rear end. Got lots of muscle mass there. Nice place to give an injection, but as you can see, I'm poorly located in terms of uh, inflicting a little bit of pain on her, sticking that needle in, and I'm certainly going to need somebody hanging onto her head because she isn't going to stick around for that. It is well set up in terms of having drainage if you uh, got an injection abscess or had a myositis or that type of thing. This comprises the three major locations that I like to use. And there are other spots if you start to really run short on muscle mass. Uh, some people use the pectorals right there. Um, I'm not particularly fond of them. Uh, in, my, in my experience, I get a lot of reactions there, so I don't tend to use them very often. And so I tend to mostly use the three locations that we have taped off here. Yeah, that's very definitely my choices too. We, we, I probably put 90% you know, of my injections into the, the neck. Uh, most of what we do, we do a lot of vaccinating and that's where we'll put a lot of the vaccinations uh, there. Uh, certainly as you mentioned back there at the semimembranosus, tendinosus, especially on a yearling like this, it's pretty light on her feet. That's not, wouldn't be your favorite place to go. It's hit or miss and I hope she, and I hope she misses. <laughs> Another way of administering medication would be the intramuscular injection. And certainly I could reasonably expect my technician to be good, really competent at giving IM injections. So we're going to go over that pretty thoroughly today. The kinds of things that you would give in an IM injection would be things like um, antibiotics, painkillers, sedatives, and of course lots and lots of vaccinations. You know, we would be vaccinating horses a big part of equine practice. So Checkers has once again very kindly volunteered to get a shot today. We're just going to use sterile water on checkers today because um, that would be sort of the least invasive sort of thing to do for him. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my needle and syringe. They come packaged together. The needle is attached to the syringe. This is a uh, twist on top, so actually it screws on and off. The other kind of lure tip is the kind that you actually just push off and on. I'm going to take my alcohol swab swab off the end of my bottle, draw up, and I think I'll just draw up one ml of water here which would be sort of like mocking up doing a vaccination. Now I'm going to remove my needle from my syringe and uh, bring myself up to a proper meniscus. I mean you see on TV how they're always like squirting this stuff up and obsessing about their meniscus. And in reality, if you get the bubbles out, that's good, but you don't have to make yourself crazy. Now, I'd like to do just a little bit of an alcohol swab on Checkers' neck. Checkers is a pretty clean guy, and you know, but mostly in large animal practice, you're just trying to get the, the worst of the gross dirt off, so we'll swab ourselves off a little place. Now, you remember anatomically, where I'm gonna go is gonna be beneath the nuchal ligament, in front of the scapula and above the spine. So I've got my little triangular section right there. In my case, I like to take the needle off the syringe. 
Uh, for me, it works better because that way if my patient jumps around, I still have a better chance of that needle staying in the horse and not falling down on the ground. So I take my needle off the syringe. I usually grab a little hunk of skin just to stabilize myself, and I don't make a big deal about it. I just put the needle in. And Checker says, ouch, but, you know, he's not really that unhappy with me. I connect my needle to my syringe. Now here's an important part. I'd like everybody to be sure and remember to always draw back on your plunger, establish a little vacuum in there, and make sure that you haven't actually gone into a blood vessel. There are lots of injectables that if they're designed to go intramuscularly, cannot go into intravenously. And should you get them intravenous, they will cause a reaction. So you have to discipline yourself and train yourself to do that. When it's time to inject, I just inject, no big deal. Pull my needle and syringe out. The checker says, oh, that hurt. And that's all there is to it. Hey, Dr. Forney, what size needles do you like to do for your IM injections? Gauge needle, length needle? Sure. Well, I, I'm an old softy. I mean, I'd like my doctors to use skinny needles, and I like to use skinny needles. So, you know, when it comes down to it, I'll use, oh, a 20, even a 22 gauge. You know, most of the vaccines are really not very viscous. I mean, you can push them through a very, very skinny needle. You know, if, if it came down to using something thicker, like procaine penicillin, then I'd be inclined to use a fatter needle, like a 19 gauge needle or something like that. And generally, um, the length of needle with little horses or with most vaccinations, I'm going to use a one-inch needle. Mm -hmm. um, with larger volume or more viscous products, I'm more inclined to use a one-and-a-half-inch needle. Or a bigger horse, I'd use right. a one-and-a-half-inch yeah. needle. But I don't know in practice that I ever use anything longer than a one-and-a-half-inch. Well, that's about the way I feel, too. And you certainly get a lot less reaction from the horse if you use a small diameter needle. No, we were taught... When I was in school, we used all 18-gauge needles, and I never use an 18-gauge needle nowadays for, for IM injections, unless it's really something that's very viscous and I need that, that large diameter. So I wouldn't use it for vaccinations. No, not at all. Now, when we're giving IM injections, we always run the risk of having uh, a little bit of an adverse reaction as far as making the horse sore there in the muscle. You know I have the same experience when you've gotten a vaccination, and gosh, that one really bothered your arm muscle for the next day or so. Well, same thing will happen here. Uh, and even though we've given the vaccination in exactly the right spot, done all the right techniques, they can still be sore the next day. And this is something that, that you as the tech, Laura, have to realize that this may happen. They uh, can get sore enough that they don't want to put their head down to eat. They don't want to turn. Uh, the rider certainly notices it a lot. Well, if they try to ride this horse, it has a, a stiff neck. So we want to be aware that that's apt to happen. Often a uh, dose or so of butazolidin does wonders for these, uh, for these stiff necks. And that, If we have to give repeated uh, injections, sorry, uh, like for instance, this horse was on penicillin and we had to give him twice a day uh, penicillin injections, we'd be moving around from one site to the next over the other side of the body, trying to minimize the reaction. We don't want to put a very much great volume in every, any one site. Maybe 20 cc's would be the, the maximum that we would put at one site. And actually, we don't use procaine penicillin too much anymore because it is so uh, inflammatory to the, the tissues and the horses get so sore from it. One of the other things that we should mention about procaine penicillin is how unique it is because uh, of the procaine reaction. That's for sure. Which is really a spectacular but transient adverse reaction to an injection. You know, despite your best technique and you pull back on that <laughs> syringe and you're sure you're not next to blood, every once in a while, if the procaine in the penicillin gets into the circulatory system, this horse is going to have a neurologic reaction. It may perhaps flip over. It may perhaps convulse. Uh, it may run around the stall as if it were blind. It is terrifying and spectacular, but fortunately brief. And I want to emphasize from your point of view that if you start to suspect that a horse is having a procaine reaction, the only thing you can do you're not going to, is get out of the stall. You know, really? 
It's transient, it's brief, and there's nothing you're going to do to change it. Right. The biggest thing is for you to stay safe, and it's for this reason that whenever we warn you, whenever you're giving procaine penicillin to the horse, that you want to be, have the, be between the horse and the door so that if you start to have some sort of reaction, you can get out the door. You won't, don't want that horse to be between you and the door. And I guess the last of the, of the kind of adverse reactions we should talk about are anaphylactic reactions, which are blissfully rare. I mean, how many have you seen? I, I can think of, you know, just about two or three that I saw a number of years ago when our vaccines weren't manufactured as well as they are nowadays. And I think it was probably due mainly to impurities in the, in the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And it was with, with cattle. I don't know that I've seen one with, with a horse. Mm -hmm. Well, I've had two in horses, it, and one um, was just last year with a West Nile vaccine. So, I mean, you know, they, they do still happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, those don't tend to be as violent as the procaine reaction, but mm -hmm. they are a true medical emergency. And it's one of the reasons that I emphasize to my client why it's important to have a veterinarian administering vaccination or being present when vaccination is being administered. Yeah, and the other thing we warn clients about is that you don't like to be doing, giving medications, uh, vaccinations, and then everybody disappears and nobody sees the horse for the next few hours because sometimes these reactions don't occur the instant you give the vaccination, but in five or ten minutes you say, oops, I'm into trouble.